This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, The Nation magazine is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. It is the country's oldest news magazine. The first issue was published on July 6, 1865, just weeks after the end of the Civil War and three months after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Over the years, it has published many of the nation's leading dissidents, academics, and activists. This is an excerpt from the new documentary, Hot Type, 150 Years of the Nation. Everybody has kind of written for the nation. Pat Buchanan wrote for the nation. Hunter Thompson wrote for the nation. Theodore Dreiser, H.L. Minken, John Dos Passos, James Agee, Sinclair Lewis. Tony Kushner, Tony Morrison, Emma Goldman, Henry James, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, Willa Cather, Kurt Vonnegut, E.L. Doctorow, Gore Vidal. Who's the first to publish James Baldwin? Cold Type was produced by Barbara Koppel. In a minute, we'll be joined by the nation's editor and publisher, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, live in studio. But first, this is another clip from Hot Type, 150 Years of the Nation, in which Katrina talks about the magazine's early history with contributing writer D.D. Guttenplan. The piece ends with the reading of a story that appeared in the nation in 1932. This is the essay I was telling you about. It's about the nation's future. It's 1955. But it, it says, mean, the nation must change as it has changed in the past. Within the last 40 years, and think about how this could be written today, within the last 40 years, one-third of our daily newspapers and more than 3,000 weeklies have ceased publication. Wow. And this is now 1955 like because we do sit here and think, you know, what is the nation's role in this media landscape? Mm. And that, you Where know, do we and then he, speaks, well, and he goes on to speak. Survive? I mean, in 1955, they were worried about being... They were worried about being strangled by by the Red Scare and by McCarthyism. You know, and people were afraid to get the nation. Yeah. And and if you got the nation, the FBI probably knew had you about on a you. list. Yeah, they probably put you on a list. The nation grew out of the Civil War. It was started by Republican abolitionists who were concerned about the state of the freedmen. We like to gloss over the first 50 years, in a way, because the nation was enmeshed with the Republican Party. It was against workers' rights. It was worried about inundation by foreigners and immigrants. It didn't really break free of the Republican Party until World War I. We think of it now as kind of a, a version of the left of the Democratic Party. I mean, I hope it's much more than that, but you could caricature it that way in some circles. But the nation that we know now really took off in the 30s. That's because of the New Deal, which really was one of the, I think, the apogees of the nation's, not just its influence, but also its flowering, its flourishing, uh, and its power. We give thanks that the economic disaster which confronts us has made men and women think has made multitudes realize that our institutions are not perfect, that there is something radically wrong with the situation under which, even at the height of prosperity, many are on the ragged edge of starvation, while others literally roll in wealth. We believe the Republic to be in jeopardy, but we have not lost faith that it can be rescued and set upon the right path to meet the needs of the situation. That was Sam Waterston reading a Nation editorial from 1932. And before that, Katrina Vanden Heuvel speaking with Didi Guttenplan, uh, who co-edited together with Katrina the Nation's 150th anniversary edition, which is more than 260 pages. That an excerpt from Coal Type, 150 Years of the Nation. And we are joined now by Katrina Vanden Heuvel, editor and publisher of The Nation, America's oldest weekly news magazine. Again, The Nation is celebrating its 150th anniversary with a quintuple-length blockbuster edition of the magazine. Uh, welcome to Democracy Amy. Now! Thank and you, Amy. Thank you, Juan. Happy birthday. Um, this is um, daunting. It is something to survive, if you think, three centuries. And um, we were founded in this great city, as Don and others said, they're by abolitionists committed 
to ending slavery, but also resonant in terms of your previous segment, Eric Foner, in one of the introductory essays in the issue, writes about the contested meaning of freedom in our history. And the founders believed in freedom as a universal birthright, but boy, has freedom been contested in these last 150 years, and we can see that it's still a battle. And those words you read from the editorial in the New Deal era, think about how resonant those are. May we save our republic from the financial crisis and despair. So um, it's those echoes, it's the fact that history remains present, remains alive. So this is about the past, present, and future, and another 150 years is what we are committed to. But I'm curious, in an age where a magazine is lucky to survive 10 years, yes. or even count itself among the, the big ones if it survives 20 or 30, how has the nation managed for 150 years to continue to publish? I think there are a number of reasons. I think. At various times, you know, this is a writer's magazine, and it's also, at this moment, as at other times in our history, there was reference to the McCarthy period. It's a, it's a magazine for voices which might otherwise be marginalized. It's a, for rebellious voices, for dissident voices, for writers' voices. For, it's also because its supporters over the years have cared more for what it stood for than what it made. It's become, it's about it being a cause, a community, as much as a publication. And I think it's that ongoing, dialogue in the pages between radicals, liberals, progressives, even conservatives with a conscience that gives it a value that transcends. And we have resisted. You know, in 1996, the nation did a series called The National Entertainment State. And it was about the threat, conglomeratization, consolidation of the media, Murdochization posed to freedom of the press. That continues today. We've been at the forefront of the fight for Internet democracy. So I think fighting for independence and never giving up on a fight uh, is part of why the nation has survived. Can you go to John Steinbeck, one of the writers um, in the nation? There are so many pieces yes. we'd like to highlight. I mean, from James Baldwin to W.E.B. Du Bois, from Molly Ivins to um, Edward Said to I.F. Stone, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote for the nation. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote an annual essay from 1961 to 1966, and his last essay, in the nation was really about moving the civil rights movement to a fight for economic justice. But in 1967, February, just two months before his Riverside speech, he came out against the Vietnam War at a nation event in Los Angeles. So I, there was a history and a, and a relationship there. And um, James Baldwin, as you said, wrote his first piece for the nation. And what's so stunning is to read in his report from occupied territory. Harlem, not the Middle East, his use of stop and frisk in 1966. Again, the echoes and the correspondence between past and present. Uh, just a year ago, uh, two years ago, the nation, and again, a different mode of storytelling, did a multimedia video exposing stop and frisk abuses in Harlem. And it was cited by Judge Scheindlin in her a court decision ruling stop and frisk discriminatory and unconstitutional. So that echo, that correspondence between past and so present. So then read James Baldwin. James Baldwin. I will read the words. This is a report from occupied territory from July 1966. The citizens of Harlem who, as we have seen, can come to grief at any hour in the streets and who are not safe at their windows are forbidden the very air. They are safe only in their houses or were until the city passed the no-knock stop-and-frisk laws, which permit a policeman to enter one's home without knocking and to stop anyone in the streets at will at any hour and search them. Harlem believes, and I certainly agree, that these laws are directed against Negroes. They are certainly not directed against anybody else. And then Baldwin goes on to write, I have witnessed and endured the brutality of the police many more times at once. But of course I cannot prove it. I cannot prove it because the police department investigates itself quite as though it were answerable only to itself, but it cannot be allowed to be answerable only to itself. It must be made to answer to the community which pays it and which is legally sworn to protect. And if American Negroes are not a part of the American community, then all of the American professions are a fraud. That's 1966. 1966. It's 50 years ago. <laughs> 50 years. So it does, I, mean, it does, I think it's, it, it raises a question which I know you grapple with here at Democracy Now! That is 50 years ago. How, how, how does change come? Change has come in very difficult, hard ways in this country. And I think we've come ways, but you can see in that the echoes, obviously, of today. I think it's a movement moment, again, as it was 
1966. It's a different movement for racial justice, but these same concerns. Can you go it, back to King? Absolutely. This was, as I said, he wrote from 1961 to 66. So this was the same year that James Baldwin wrote in This the was the same year. This was a few months before that. This was the last steep ascent, it's called. At the end of 1965, the civil rights movement was widely depicted as bewildered and uncertain, groping desperately for new directions. The substantial legislative accomplishments of the past several years, it was argued, dealt so extensively with civil rights problems that the movement had become stagnated in an embarrassment of riches. Negro leaders, we were told, did not know how to maintain their assembled armies nor what goals they should seek. The dominant white leadership of the nation in perceiving the civil rights movement as uncertain and confused is engaged in political projection. The Negro freedom movement has a policy and a program. It is the white power structure that gropes in indecision. White America, caught between the Negro upsurge and its own conscience, evolved a limited policy toward Negro freedom. It could not live with the intolerable brutality and bruising humiliation opposed upon the Negro by the society it cherished as democratic. A wholesome national consensus developed against extremist conduct toward non-white Americans. That feeling found expression in laws, court decisions, and in the alteration of long entrenched custom. But the prohibition of barbaric behavior, while beneficial to the victim, does not constitute the attainment of equality or freedom. A man may cease beating his wife without thereby creating a wholesome maritable, marital relationship. Oh, that was Dr. King in 66. And, King, and King very forcefully later in that piece, as I said, raised the critical importance of economic justice, of economic equality and freedom, which of course he brought with him in the last days of his life to protests. Could you know, I want to ask you, uh, much of the attention uh, of, on the nation is on its political role, but it has also played a major cultural yes, role in, yeah. in terms of cultural criticism. Could you talk about that, uh, that aspect of the magazine's contribution? This special issue, I think, brings to, be, you know, brings to life, first of all, the great poets who have written for the nation, from Sylvia Plath to Adrian Rich to Amiri Baraka, Allen Ginsberg. Um, and it, has, over the years, the critics have elevated ideas and artists. Clement Greenberg elevating Jackson Pollock, the New York School. Harold Clerman, a great theater critic. James Agee was our film critic. He writes in here about uh, John Huston. Stuart Klawans is one of is a great film critic today. Arthur Danto, who died just a while ago, was an eminent philosopher who, whose essays about it, from everything from Andy Warhol to Las Vegas and art, elevated that. Interestingly, the nation, as we call it, the back of the book, the literary, the literary section, was at war with the front during the 40s and 50s, politically and culturally. I mean, there was, in the, it, there was a, a, a kind of anti-communist liberalism in the back, and in the front there was a vigorous, uh, led by the editor then, Frida Kirchway, a kind of anti-fascist uh, unwillingness to ally with what Arthur Schlesinger called vital center Cold War liberals. So that battle went on both culturally and politically. Um, but those brawls, you know, Christopher Hitchens didn't just write about politics for us. I mean, he would engage. And Katha Pollitt, our great columnist, one of her great essays was canon to the right of me, I think, and she still writes about cultural issues. In, uh, when we can get Speaking of battles, Israel-Palestine, Edward, Edward Said, the late great professor of comparative literature at uh, Columbia University, leading Palestinian voice. When did he write? He, his first piece for the nation was in a special issue uh, in 33 years ago. Uh, Kai Bird, uh, who was a longtime editor at the nation, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Robert Oppenheimer, has a fascinating essay in, in, the, in this issue coming off of the special issue called Myths of the Middle East, published 33 years ago, calling for essentially disengagement, U.S. disengagement with the Middle East at this point. Edward Said wrote his first piece for the nation in that issue. I also remember in um, the time of the Oslo Accords, I was then editor, and we published Edward's uh, essay as a cover story, denouncing the Accords, seeing, I think, in a prescient way that they were leading to He became a Bantu pariah Stan. in yeah. the establishment and, and it was, And I that. will say that the nation, uh, you know, has many readerships, and part of its readership is a liberal readership. And there were many who th thought that it was premature that we published that essay, who uh, found it offensive, who uh, called, you know, who... There, 
one of the editors, Oswald Garrison Villard, said the week was not full if he had not received his requisite number of uh, cancellations. Uh, today they come in different ways, but th there's no question that one of the roles of the nation is, I believe, to lift up ideas that might be cr considered heretical at one, in, at one time that later in another generation appear m more common sense. Now, the Israel-Palestine issue remains deeply contested. I would, you know, 1954, Bernard Fall, the great historian of Vietnam, argued in our pages that maybe a negotiated solution to Vietnam would be better than what came, thousands killed. Um, and I think on a number of fronts, the opposition to the war in Iraq, which, you know, democracy now was very much part of. There were very few media outlets at that time in the run-up to the war. Um, we were called names. We were vilified. F opposing war after 9-11 was not a popular stance. But that is part of what I think the role of the nation has been, to stand apart, to, to not, you know, not the f faith in what can happen when you tell people the truth is something that uh, is part of our DNA. But, Edward, um, this is not the piece I mentioned, but this was in uh, September 8, 1997, and he writes, Edward Said, the great scholar of Joseph Conrad, the writer, by the way, is, it has taken almost four years for the Oslo peace process to peel off its cosmetic wrappings to reveal the stark truth hidden at its core. There was no peace agreement. Instead, Palestinians entered an appalling spiral of loss and humiliation gulled by the United States and the media into thinking that we had at last achieved some measure of respectability, bludgeoned by Israel into accepting its pathological definition of security, all of which has impoverished our people who are obliged, obliged to watch more settlements being built, more land taken, more houses destroyed, more sadistic collective punishments meted out. Israel should explain why we should forget the past, remain uncompensated, our travails unacknowledged, even as all other victims of injustice have the right to reparations, apologies, and the like. There is no logic to that, only the cold, hard, narcissistic indifference of amoral power. And that is Edward Said in 1997. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion and talk about what's happening today as well in electoral politics in this country. Katrina Vanden Heuvel is editor and publisher of The Nation, America's oldest weekly magazine. It is celebrating its 150th anniversary with a quintuple-length blockbuster edition of The Nation. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, back in a minute.